Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, sorry about that, we had a little bit of an audio issue. We're still having a slight video issue on our end as well. We're getting all this fixed up, and there we go. We had the players stop as well, so you see this is where we were. Mm -hmm. See the graphs is still out blocking. So, you didn't miss anything, don't worry about it. Oh, whoever's doing the card viewer, they got a little, uh, they, got uh, a little they have a little yeah. fun with it here. Pedal to the metal, that is exactly what this turn was. Look at how Looks much they're like having to clean week. up. What was that, 10 cards? Whoever's doing the card viewer, bravo, bravo. Mm -hmm. All right, so we saw Shasta take a ton of damage that turn. I believe he's down to, I think, 16. We'll have to get the life total update as well. Sorry about that, everybody at home. We'll make sure you don't miss any of the action. But look, his tunic is just going up to two here, and he's still got the, the first channel, Mount Heroic, yeah. in play as well here. But now it's his turn. Yeah. There's been a big turn from the five. Now we've got a channel, Mount Heroic, active of four cards from Sasha. Cool hand. It does look like, I think you said this, there's a Ravenous Rabble in there. I think, unfortunately, yeah, I think two of these cards of aren't nature, attacked. Channel. Is that an Autumn's mm -hmm. Touch? I think that's an Autumn's Touch uh, as well. Yeah. So, a couple of Earth cards here. If Sasha wants to use both of those for resources, he can keep around the Channel Minor Oak. I don't know if that's exactly what he wants to do this turn, though. We'll have to see how Sasha wants to put all this together. The problem with it is, like, you know, Briar's going to put up a big turn this turn, right? Like a big tall attack. He's not going to go anywhere near as wide. Mm -hmm. Phi does. So it's a little harder for other decks to block when you go super wide like that, when you're trading one card for one. But sometimes one big attack gets it done too. But we'll see if Sasha has enough to get himself back in this game because Wesley is at a pretty low life total at 28. Sasha's, though, definitely not a 40 for everybody at home. I, I yeah. believe it was 16. Somewhere around there. I think so, but I'm not entirely sure. Alright, looks like we're going to start the turn there of Force of Nature, revealing Autumn's Touch. Gonna go ahead and play the Channel Minor Rogue mm -hmm. for next turn. Now this does double up. It does make an embodiment of lightning, so this has go again here. And I was gonna say this is going to be attacking for Oh, oh and the Gorgon Oh look at the <laughs> response from Sasha too. He hits the tome. <laughs> yep. Uh Kobe. It's, it's, it's the shot from downtown. It looks like an eight power. I'm sorry, this is as well, that's not even enough. There Twelve power <laughs> Ravage Rebel because of the double that's about right. channel mount heroic plus the tome being on top, just like you draw it up. And uh, just like Sasha did last turn, was like, yep, that's enough. I'll take it. Yep. Send me the bill. Yeah. All right, looks like the Tome's yeah. going to go to hand here. Bad part about this, so good part about the revealing the Tome, extra damage comes in. Bad part, doesn't defend. Uh, true. And that could, be, that could be a big deal coming into this turn. Oh, he draw it with the Force of Nature. Oh, yeah, right. He draws it with Force of Nature. Yeah, yeah, there's a draw yeah. set for Force of Nature. I apologize. Yeah, everybody at home. And the card that he drew, let's see. Is there something else that he could play this turn? Does look like another Ravenous Rabble. And this one is going to come in for a little bit less, though. Oh. But with two mountains still. Yeah, so. still. Yeah, it's still a lot, right? It's, it's, it's not 14, though. He and it looks like, it. yeah, Wesley's going to take it as well. He's got a full grip and he knows what he's going to do with it. He's going to throw all of it at Sasha's face. Was that eight? Yeah, I think that was eight. It does look like we're going to be able to follow this up with making of a rune chant and attacking with mm -hmm. a Rosetta Thorn for two, two, and one. I think Buster's going to take all of that as well. We'll get these life totals updated as soon as we possibly can. Again, we're sorry for the issue at home. Everybody looks like Wesley's down to five. Sasha's definitely not at 40. Yeah. <laughs> Should be somewhere in the 15, 16. 16 range, yeah. yeah. I trust you a little more than me on this one. You were counting up all that damage a lot that turn. You were so curious to see what was going to happen and how much yeah, damage. Yeah, that's true, but I couldn't get the, the same number. We'll mm -hmm. see. Oh, 13. Okay. There we go. So there we go. We're down to 13, so you see why Wesley's willing to just take so much damage here this turn. Oh, okay, looks like he's going to block out okay. just a little bit of the thorn here. Yep, Chain of Monarchs going to go away, though the second one is still there for next turn. So, Nada. Yeah, he's going to draw up. I wonder how many of these cards have enough block on them because uh, Sasha's about to get assaulted by a lot <laughs> here this turn. 
Both players practically out of equipment. Sasha still has a couple blocks left. He has one on his grasp, one on his tunic. That can matter as well. Yeah. Wesley, though, he's naked when it comes to the armor here. He's got nothing left over, so everything's going to be played from the hand here. Or the, the Phoenix Flames coming back. There should be two of them, I think, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, because he got one of them out with the, mm -hmm. the, the Retribution, yeah. Is that the Razor Reflex in his hand? Yeah, you were pointing this out to me during our break, yeah, that there's a, there's a one of Razor Reflex in this deck, and uh, it's a card that I'm actually, I just absolutely love, and it does look that like that might be the Razor Reflex in his hand. He's got two resources floating here. He's got a Brand of Cinderclaw as well. How does he want to sequence all of this? It looks like here comes the weapon. So that would probably mean that he is out of resources here. Yep. Yep. Don't know if he's going to be able to present lethal this turn. And that's kind of scary if you think you, you can't present lethal. Sasha's gonna, still got that Channel Mount Heroic coming back. And exactly. it does look like Sasha's taking that risk. I love this play from Sasha. Yeah, and we'll h he'll have the, the Tunic resource also. That's a really good point. He's going to have an extra free resource. So that means Rosetta Thorn's probably coming in behind anything else that's going on. Here comes an attack from that Brand with Cinderclaw. Let's see if Sasha's still willing to just take this. Kind of believe he's got to be. This game is so close. It's usually about who's faster in this case, so we'll see. Yeah, I think the yeah usually the I think actually the five deck is, is slightly advantage because like you know we're talking about they're they're usually better at just being on average a little bit better yeah. per turn. But Sasha drawing these two channel mount heroics early exactly. is exactly what you need in this matchup. Also, I think he's played this game really well. Both players have just being willing to take a ton of damage to be able to just deal back even yeah. more. And also the um, the ravenous into tome, oh, Gorganian huge. tome. Yeah. That was because he drew it with the uh, force of nature, so that was really really good. Yeah, I think you, you know you don't usually see that kind of emotion of players in the feature <laughs> match. I love <laughs> seeing the reactions though. Phoenix flame coming in for a little bit of damage here as well. Sasha really weighing this block. Yeah. Maybe one of the equipment comes out to gain a life here. Maybe the grasp. Briar and Fi both coming off of decent showings at the uh, the calling here last week in Singapore for Briar decks in the top eight. So that's yeah. kind of led me to the understanding and just believing that it was going to be one of the most popular decks here. And it definitely was. It was the most represented deck here in CC this weekend. Yeah, that makes sense. How many dashes did we have? <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> we had 20-something, like 28, mm -hmm. if I remember right, the right number. You know, I could look that up. I actually thought dash would be less represented than people thought, thought it was going to be, but it's definitely a, a favor here. I know Matt Rogers is playing it, one of our players who was 3-0 on camera. Yeah, I was just thinking about how popular it would be from last week. How many people mm -hmm. would thought about changing their plans and going into a tally shot dash all of yeah, a sudden? Yeah. Exactly. We had 27 here this weekend. It was the uh, it was tied for sixth in representation. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the fifth and sixth representation they're practically the same deck. It's it's yeah. not same, but it's Oldham and Bravo, and they're very similar. So I kind of mesh those together. Yeah. But it was the last of like the highly represented decks. When you go beyond that, you're you're going to much much lower representation. You're going to single digits. Mm -hmm. But I gotta say this: props to LSS. This this uh, this meta game, wide open. Yeah, exactly. You, I mean, the numbers in the top decks are really really good. The fact that there's no dominant hero at the moment. Oh, oh. really big reveal from Sasha. They're able to get a two off of the Sonata. That's gonna get two. Arcane damage as well at Wesley. Yeah. That's the biggest thing that I think might actually just lock this game up because Wesley has no way to stop Arcane here. And you've got to believe that there's more Arcane coming as well from that Rosetta Thorn this turn. Also, another free attack added to Sasha's hand. That's really big. How does he want to sequence this? We see a Weave Earth. See Wesley down to four. I'm sorry, down to 
down to three. That's, yeah. that's where I thought he was, down to three. If he's at two, I think he's practically dead already because the thorn is just representing so much. That's the problem. Is Wesley's going to have to block every piece of damage that comes through this turn because if any arcane damage comes through, the thorn will just finish him off. Let's go. Yep, force revealing Weave Earth. So another arcane damage down to him, down to Wesley. So now he's at two. Yep, he's going to go ahead and just block a bunch on the seven power attack. Yeah. I'm sorry, that was an explosive growth. I apologize. I thought that was a force of nature. Yeah. Hmm, Thank you for okay. seven. Yeah, it looks like we're going to activate the creepers to instant speed out a card. Tome. Yeah, instant speed out a tome. Body of lightning created. Tome's going to draw a card. Oh, it's <laughs> a miss! You see the fist bump from Wesley yeah. here. <laughs> He's still at three. The thorn doesn't kill him. But this is, a, I think, a fully powered Gloomvale. So it's attacking for seven. And one card to block, yeah. so. Attacking for eight. So this block, yep. and then the fist there bump. And like we said, Blinky, you just might miss it. Uh, two decks that generally don't want to be blocking much, but Sasha with these well-timed yep. channel mount heroics coming through in the clutch, getting through that extra damage. And well played on both sides, we've got to say, Sasha having the fortitude to just take all of that damage in those really scary spots. I think I might have blocked a little bit too much in that game to be able to win it from the Briar side. So really well mm, played from yeah. him. Laura, how'd you feel about that match? Oh, it was interesting. Three turns. So <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> we, we did see a tuna counter. I didn't think we might, but... Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, it, that's the usual matchup that we're going to see today, uh, right. probably. So we'll have to get used to it, but yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll get some Guardians in there to maybe slow a few things down, but that was a really, really quick one. So thanks for joining us for yeah, this round. Thank thanks you. for telling us about your, your OP team and your localization team. Anything else you want to say about it before you go? Um, not much. Just keep <laughs> attending your local game stores and promoting the game because it helps a lot to grow the community that uh, in the end attends all of these great events. So just keep doing that. <laughs> awesome. Hey, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thank you for having so me. So don't go anywhere. We're going to have an interview with James White when we come back. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Flesh and Blood.
everybody, welcome back to the Pro Tour here in Lille. I'm Tanner Grace. I'm joined by the man, none other than himself, James White. How you doing, James? I'm doing great, man. And uh, yeah, thank you for getting me on the in the booth. And thanks uh, for finding time. I know how busy you are. <laughs> I mean, look, we're having a fantastic time here in Lille. There's an incredible turnout, just so many countries represented from around the world. And look, this is the, the, the mission uh, in action right here. You know, people coming together through the common language of playing great games and you don't get anything better than uh, what's on display here today. Absolutely. Speaking of what's on display, I think everybody wants to know what this is behind us right here. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to shoot it over to a video <laughs> reveal of this car. It's going to take a few minutes. We're going to come back in and answer a few questions from James as well. Folks, we have a special treat in store for you today. <laughs> this is the beginning of the Dynasty preview season. Did you, uh, did you have, have a little helium before this? Yeah, or? honestly, I sound just like that, eh? The one, the only, the emperor of vocal. There we go. Are you ready? The cheer was much louder, by the way. Are you ready? <laughs> they, were, they were really ready. All right, let's yeah, do Yeah, we're this. having some fun. So I got to see this like a minute or two before this reveal and so like I read the card I was like okay this is pretty cool I read the ability I was like okay that's very specific and then uh, <laughs> we're gonna zero in on something right here that you pointed out to me and it made my jaw drop so at home you can see everybody you may only have red cards in your deck and it's an action that allows you to search your deck for a command and conquer and the big part for me as we've come back here is is this part right here it's a royal draconic warrior wizard hero yeah. What the hell, James? Yeah, for real. Look, he is the Emperor of Volcor, right? Like, he's one of the most important people in Wraith. So we needed to just, like, go above and beyond to deliver on something which was, uh, like, significant, something unique, like a heavy-hitting, just wow factor. So, look, he is the first dual-class hero uh, in the game. Uh, you know, first time you've ever been able to mash up cards from two classes into one deck. Uh, and then he gets the kicker of being royal. I mean, look, he's the Emperor. He's got to be royal, right? Uh, so you might be asking, what does that actually mean? Well, I'm not going to tell you right up today, <laughs> to be honest. Like, that's how I roll, but uh, it is significant, and it does unlock um, you know, additional effects of some cards that, that you will see coming through in Dynasty. Oh, I'm super excited about that. Now, we see that it has you know, 15 health over here as well, so that means that it's a young hero. Is there, is there an adult of this? Um, this hero is made for Blitz. Okay. Yeah, yeah he's, he's young only, but... Um, uh, look, he's, he was definitely one of the, the fan favorites inside the, the dev team. Um, and look, I think that, that fans around the world are going to have a great time uh, bringing him to, to the Blitz tables uh, as we uh, come, th come through to the end of the year with uh, Dynasty releasing just after the World Championship, and then he'll be, he'll be primed and ready to go for the next season of Skirmish. Oh, I'm really excited about that. Now, you were talking to me a little bit about his name. Why don't you give me a little information more on this name? Because we've seen this title before. Yeah, so... Um, this, uh, his name is, you can't really see it on here, but it's uh, Emperor Drakei of Issa. And so it's one of the naming conventions from the Imperials uh, from, from the Volcor region is they are Drakei of something, whatever, like, you know, their, their thing that they're responsible for or, or their, like, pro, uh, specialization. is. So, you know, obviously Kano was the Drakei of Ether. You know, he's called, sort of like the Royal Court Wizard. And then we have Taipanis, the uh, Drakei of uh, Judgment. Uh, and... The Emperor is the Draco of Issa, so Issa's are like the, the like high-end uh, sort of godly entities that exist in our world. And uh, as you'll see the storytelling start to come through over the next month or so as we lead into the release of Dynasty, uh, we've got some fantastic lore that's coming through the pipeline and will be published on fabtcd.com. You'll start to understand what that title actually means. And uh, look, being uh, the Emperor of Volcor, it isn't just all... Uh, uh, opulence. There is uh, a heavy burden, you know, that that rests uh, uh, on the shoulder of the emperor, and uh, it, it's connected to his name. And you'll be able to, yeah, deep dive into all of that good law as it as it comes through from our creative team uh, in the coming coming weeks and months. Is that going to be reflected in the set as well? Um, yeah, I mean, the set is very much the continuation of that story arc from Uprising. We've got the Volkai who are uprising to try and overthrow the Imperials or the the Drakei. Um and like this is. Uh, sort of like wrapping up that that small micro uh, uh, like story arc within the greatest story arc that's that's happening within the world, you know, which is essentially like the War of the Monarchs, which is uh, like the the macro level story arc, and sort of where we are in Volcor at this point in time is a smaller story that sits inside that bigger arc. 
Um, but yeah, I think, look, what we've done with uh, Uprising into Dynasty is our best example yet of connecting the, the lore and the, the narrative from one set to the next. Uh, and yeah, like I'm, I'm really proud with what the team uh, was able to bring together in both gameplay and also the, the creative uh, visual design of the set. And yeah, I think it's a really tidy package. Well, so far, I think you've knocked it out of the park. The, the art that we've seen here so far is amazing. I love the look of this. Look, I know you're really busy. I want to get one more question in. You came to New Jersey, Pro Tour 1, and you were talking about how it was like the culmination of like all the work you've done. I mean, there were practically tears in your eyes of how happy you were with everything. Yeah, man. How's it feel to bring it to Europe? Um, look, it's incredible to be here. It's just such a pleasure to be in Europe. Um, and the, the hospitality and, and, and warm, uh, warm welcome that we've received from the French community uh, has just been amazing. Like, the turnout is just phenomenal. Like, yeah. I mean, being able to take flesh and blood and to for our organized play circuit to be traveling around the world, whether it's the Battle Harden uh, series, which is, you know, near weekly now, or the callings, um, uh, or, or the pinnacle being the Pro Tour in the World Championship, and to really see the game grow into a, a very significant global community. Um, and, you know, the organized play programs that we're offering, it, it is unmatched in the TCG industry. Like, we are the leader, and if you want to play, uh, you know, if you want to play the game and see the world, Fish and Blood is the place to be doing that. <laughs> so, look, I really, you know, it, it, this is just uh, a great example of the common, common language of playing great games, bringing people together from all across the world in one place at one time in Lille. Uh, and, yeah, it, it's, 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 really, it's really meaningful, man. Look, from everyone at home and from myself... Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for everything that you do for us for this great game and for getting us a really, really cool reveal this weekend. <laughs> like I said, I know you're super busy, so we'll get you out of here. Thank you so much for this reveal for joining with us today. Everybody, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Flesh and Blood. Thank you.
everybody, welcome back to the Pro Tour 2 here in Lille. I'm Tanning Grace, that's Craig Krimples. Craig, we're going to get a little bit of a backup match from the round that we had, because it, it ended pretty quickly, even with the interview from James. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to get as much of that backup round in as we can until we're about ready for the next round to start. So you'll, there's a chance we might see an abrupt end to this game in okay. the middle of it. All right, let's, All right. let's get as much fab in as we can. Yeah, and so we get uh, one of the heroes that we mentioned quite a bit over the last is Prism, something that's right on the edge of this might be the last time you see her. She's very close to becoming a living legend. It, yeah, just the slightest nudge, right? A breeze will push her off. over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a hero that's been here for quite a while, hadn't really been played much until last week coming out of nowhere to win the calling in Singapore. Y you say that, but there were some players. Yeah, they were talking about it. Yeah, there were some, some, some whispers. The, well, I think it was more than whispers. A couple of players put out some early tier lists. You're right, yeah. Uh, three or four weeks before the Pro Tour. I, I will say this. One of them got readily dismissed as like a joke. You know, they thought he was trolling. And uh, I remember talking to Tarek, you know, Patel about, you know, this, this Pro Tour. And he's like, it's, it's actually really high on my list right now. Yeah. And uh, do, do, do you know a reason why people were, you know, picking this up again? Well, well Dash is uh, one of the more versatile heroes. And it doesn't take that many cards to, to flip-flop from being this very aggressive to this very controlling strategy. So maybe in a wide open field like this, y you want that versatility to, to be able to craft your strategy depending on what sits down across from you. And generally Dash has like one of the problems that I have with some decks like this. One of the things I don't like is like it's just generic damage. You know, nothing really comes yep. along with it. Like, you know, we have Lexi, you have on hits. When you have this, you're doing all these extra things. But in a format like this that involves Briar, it involves Phi, these decks that just aren't blocking, you actually hit really, really hard. And, you if, really do. and if they're doing generic, who cares? Yeah, I mean, when it's just two decks attacking each other, the dash gets to start with a Teclo Pounder in play. It's mm -hmm. just like six extra points of damage. Uh, they can set up for that big turn with the, um, help me out, the 10 attack that comes in at the end. Maximum velocity. Maximum velocity, thank you. I was gonna say, I remember because we always we always joke, we're like, you know, take it to the max or whatever. Like, I was trying to remember what the actual <laughs> card is. I will never sing on stream again. I apologize You're to everybody. You're just singing at home. in your head there. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, you saw me start dancing before I even did it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm that guy. Sorry, everybody at home. All right, any surprises here from the players and their uh, their equipment suite? No, I I think these are pretty regular setups. Uh, we see the Teclo Pounder that I just mentioned. Uh, along with the gauntlets, it's just as much damage piled on top of your attacks as possible. And it's funny, if you know this is coming, sometimes you can just block a whole bunch and fatigue out these dash decks. Yeah, so that was our, actually our plan in testing. When we started testing the dash deck, we found it to be pretty good. We're, like, very impressed. Uh, the team that I was playing with when I say we, the team that I was, you know, testing with sure. a little bit, because I don't play in the event, but I help out. And they were all moving towards dash until... They figured out in the mirror the way to beat it was to take out almost all the equipment and like items from your deck and just move into all the block threes yep. and try to fatigue. And then they're like, wait, can we just do this with all our decks? And they started doing that, and then all of them just immediately moved off dash. Well, so, some of the decks can do it, but right, so, some. some of the decks can't. Um, you, you, you think about Briar, sometimes they get four blocks, right? If they've got that embodiment of Earth. Uh, Viscerai has a decent amount of three blocks, but like Phi, it's chock full of two blocks. Yeah. If they start trying to block against you, you just roll right over and, them. And that's why Dash did so well, right? You saw four or five make it to the top eight, and then, oh, boy, we got a really blinged-out version of, of Dash here. It's going to wreak oh, havoc yeah. on these cameras. <laughs> all foils all the time, baby. Yeah. Really taking it to the max. <laughs> oh, it even gets into the dice because they're clear. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Looks like we got a double block on a five or six power attack here. It's a Herald of Erudition and a Piercing Reality. Yeah, and, and the Prism player might just be on on that plan. Like, hey. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the equipment suite here, this is pretty defensive. Yeah, you, you present attacks, I'm going to block them. Yeah. Presenting another attack here, boosting. Because here's another reason why, you know, fatiguing them out works so well. Is every time they attack, they're milling a card. So yes. when, you're, yep. when you're boosting a lot, you know, they're going to go through 15 to 20 cards in a game that way exactly when each of their attacks is two cards down they go through the deck pretty fast yeah it looks like load up the pistol shoot the pistol at you yeah that was another thing in the mirror that we found like sometimes if dash 
you know, they uh, they play the other equipment that gets the rust counters that attacks for a lot more. Attacks for four, but yep. you only get three attacks with it. Yep. And Talishar. If, Talishar, yeah. And if you're in the and if you're in the mirror and one of them has that and the other one is playing defensively, it's it's actually very easy to run them out because they don't have the pistol to, to lean on long game. Yeah. As soon as that weapon runs out, it's over. Yeah. yeah you have no more freebie attacks. Yeah. Yeah. And see, here we see Prism just I think fully going into the. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play the long game here. Yeah. We'll call it the turtle. Yeah. They're turtling up. Just, just pulling that head into the shell. It's just a, it's just a ghost turtle. A ghost turtle. It's a, it's a prism turtle. You know, it's a, it's an illusion. It's an angel turtle. It's an, okay, okay, you're right. It's an angel <laughs> turtle. <laughs> Who's your favorite ninja turtle? Oh, jeez. You know we had to go there. Come on, Raphael. I was a Leonardo guy. I was lame. Ah, T Bone. This is a sweet one. So when this one attacks, it actually has to be blocked with an equipment piece as well. But there's some kind of freebie freebie blocks a little bit here for the uh, Prism player. There are. Uh, we see pumped by that Teclo Pounder. Um, yeah, the footsteps are so effective at blocking. They're actually even better when they're on the pistol plan. Because every time they load the pistol, it breaks the combat chain, and then you can block with these footsteps again. Yeah, so... The thing of T-Bone, T-Bone's really, really good in some matchups where it just automatically has to be blocked by some equipment, something like, you know, think of like Vis and stuff that doesn't have a free one. But if you run into some of the other heroes that have just freebies, like if you have something that just doesn't have a blocking uh, amount, you can just keep blocking, like, you know, Crown of Seeds or yep. something like that. You can yep. like, yeah, here you go. <laughs> it doesn't yep, do the anything. The Snapdragon Scalers. Yeah, Snapdragon Scalers is a good one, too. Yeah, here you go. You, you just have it. But in some matchup, this card can be pretty devastating at times. Well, and if you ever roll up the hand with, with two or three of these, that's when you just get to eat all of their equipment, right? And you get to do it early in the game when they weren't prepared to block with them. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like T-Bone got blocked by a piece of equipment, a card from hand. This looks like, what is this, a zipper hit? Or a throttle, I can't tell from here. Whatever it is, it looks like it's going to be blocked by the footsteps, and we're going to put something into our soul here. Oop, maybe not. <laughs> and a block from a Herald of Erudition. All right. Yeah, you got to pick all, choose all of your blocks before you pay for those footsteps. Right. I believe that's the throttle on the end of the combat chain. It looks like another block from Arcanine Skullcap. Make sure you get your value in there. Oh, and the Skullcap even got involved there. I expect that our life totals are off just a little bit here. Because, the, you know, the skull cap doesn't get involved in the mix blocking if, right, if yeah, you're not at a lower life Chu total. Chu definitely taken some, some damage here, some stuff that leaked through. Little rules check on those phantasmal footsteps. I don't blame them. I mean, they do so much, and you know, when you see counters going on and off and stuff, you know, blocking, and then like no counters going on, they can get a little weird. Sometimes you need to refamiliarize yourself with it. I, I'll tell you this: at least once a game, when I play against a hero that's like not something that I play, I gotta give me that. I gotta. Read oh that yeah, card. E even a regular card. Yeah. Yep. You know, sometimes we're like, uh, you know, you pick up a certain card, and you're like, wait, you gotta read this one. And you're like, look, man, no judgment here. Like. So well, it, it, it's more embarrassing if it's the mirror, right? When it's the mirror, that one's really funny. They, yeah, they yeah. play one against you, and you're like, oh, gosh, i got to make sure yeah. I understand exactly how this card this, works. This card's in your deck, correct? But it's in my deck. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pick it up and read it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Please, no one make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> Please, no one make fun of me. Exactly. Uh, well, you're a pro tour qual uh, quality player. I don't think anybody's going to make fun of you for that. I, 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 I definitely will. I was about to say, I think it's more likely someone makes yeah, fun I know, of me right? for that. Exactly. So... Uh, looks like we're back to the booth here for just a moment. I think we're clearing up some some more technical difficulties. Sorry for everybody at home. Uh, now, 
for CC, I'll, I'm going to pull this back up. So everybody at home, sorry that I'm doing this for you, but like we have a representation for the decks here today. Yep. And uh, we saw Briar uh, last round. You didn't get to see it, but Sasha Makovic was playing against was playing against uh, Fi, and there was about three turns in the game. I, I saw some of this game, yeah. and it seemed like he averaged one and a half Channel Mount heroics each turn. Yeah, exactly. That's what I say. One and a half. So he, he drew one into another one. Got to kind of he had a Gregorian tome on a, a ravenous rabble and then got to draw it so it wasn't in his hand next turn so he had something that blocks if he needs it. Uh, the five player you know isn't blocking as well. Not not taking anything away from the five player. Sasha had to walk a razor's edge in that game because he figured out he's like I actually can't block because I have these channel Maharogs. I'll never be able to win yep. because if I don't get maximum value from them, I can't win the game. Yeah, he just spent two cards getting this into play, right? Mm -hmm. So now if he doesn't get value out of it on the back end what are you doing why is this yeah, card in your deck exactly now it looks like we're actually about ready for the next round so that's why we had that abrupt end of the okay, game sorry okay. about that for everybody so what we're going to do is we're going to go to a very short break and we'll be right back with that next round so don't go anywhere we'll be right back with more flesh and blood
Hey everyone, I'm Jacob and I want to invite you to our channel called Mystery Year. We are a group of competitive players and friends from Poland and the thing we love the most is playing the game, whether it's testing new decks, visiting every RTN in Poland or flying to callings and pro tours, we do it all. With so much time invested in the game, we thought that it would be great to share our love for flesh and blood with other people. Uh, and it's a lot of fun for us, so that's what you will find on Mystery Gear. Group of friends having fun with the game. Whether it's gameplays, box openings or tournament vlogs, we always love doing that. So, if you want to see more, visit our channel, watch some videos and leave a like and subscribe. Cheers from Poland and have fun with Flesh and Blood! Hello guys! Welcome everyone! We want to introduce our channel Fabrica. We are two friends from Kyiv, Ukraine and we are creating high-quality gameplay videos for people who love this game. On our channel we play matches in different formats, such as Classic Constructed, Blitz and Commoner. Every Flesh and Blood fan can find something interesting on our channel and we hope you will enjoy it.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, round six is around the corner. Flake, Roma, man, the action so far has been exquisite. Every single game I've watched has been amazing. I don't know how these guys do it, but they are all incredible to watch. We just oh, got the deck list yeah. from our intern, Tanong Race. Which one do you want? Uh, which one do I want? You know what? Give me this one. I okay. want this one. So yeah, this, one's a, this one's a good one. And uh, to quote uh, Tanong, uh, he said, Show me what you got, Ninja Boy. It is Oldham versus Fi. Oh, yeah. It's going to be interesting. Uh, definitely. And the reason being is, uh, I mean, Fi brings the high-octane offense, and Oldham just shuts it right Absolutely. down. Absolutely. He's going to try, at least, because some of the latest leads of, 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 uh, of Fi are ready for this Guardian matchup. So I don't know where it's going to fare this, this time. I, uh, I haven't lo looked exactly at uh, Oldham, uh, Oldham's list, at Jonathan's list, but it's going to be interesting to see how he manages to, to slow him down. So uh, one thing of note here is we've got one red pummel. Only one. Two yellow pummels. Okay. And I'm looking. It doesn't look like there's any blue pummels in here. Uh, but again, I think the ga name of the game in this case is likely that it's just going to be a full defensive swing here. Now, Oldham in this tournament itself, I didn't think was going to be highly represented uh, or uh, mainly because Prism is still a thing. And Prism against Oldham is like a sure thing. It's a freebie. Yeah. So what we can expect in this game, Roma, I think is more of a defensive stance. Probably, but what, from what we've seen so far, from all the tasting and from all the, the talks I had with pro players preparing for the, for the tournament, is that Fai is ready for this matchup and it's almost impossible to prevent him from uh, doing 40, 40 damage during the course of the game if you only try to stop him. You yes. need at some point to crush him. You need at some point to to hit him with to uh, hit him hard. We saw it with um, with Lex Lexi uh, two rounds ago. And if you only hit, it doesn't work. You need to hit. You need to disrupt his ga game plan. And you you need to find a way to force him to use the cards in his hand. If you let him go wide. It's never going to work. And in this case, we see Oldham already using the defense reaction yeah. by pitching Pulse of Eisenloft, getting double duty on that D react. And as you see. Fai starts his turn without an arsenal, so that's perfect for him. He lost one of one point of defense on his uh, equipment uh, on the cranial, uh, on the um, crater fist. fist, but uh, but he still managed to avoid giving uh, giving uh, an arsenal spot to his uh, to his opponent. So that's nice, and that's a red choke slam. That is a red choke and slam. That's exactly what you want to see. When Absolutely. You're now, if Choke Slam deals four or more damage, that's the crush effect. Attack action cards can't gain attack. So things like Phoenix Flames are always going to come in for yes. zero. Yeah, and uh, Fai loves to, uh, to to pump all his attacks anyway. You, you get rid of things like Art of War, who's really annoying. You get rid of uh, Shuko Trigger, so it's really, really important to to make sure that this never happens. I like seeing here the stalagmite, the Bastion of Eisenloft yeah. as the offhand defensive shield. Again, blocks for two and then for one before being busted up. But every uh, instance of block will create a frostbite. Yeah. That is crucial to the defensive stance that uh, Oldham wants to play. The question here is, is this just pure fatigue? No. There's no way you can play, play pure fatigue. And as you've seen, he, he attacks with a, with a Chuck Salam, so he cut a card and he managed to attack. All right, so he's just thinking about what he wants to do here. Just kind of, uh, you know, again, Phi in this case, it's not just about stringing together three or four attacks. You need to go wider than that if you want to penetrate through that defensive shield that uh, is Oldham. You need to be able to hit breakpoints, attacks that are like four or five, attacks that go wide, awkward attacks, attacks that might lead Oldham to just let them through. Come in with a one, come in with a five rather than two threes. That's splitting that damage is what's going to be crucial here uh, for Fi to really be able to uh, eventually find an avenue, find a margin, a crack Absolutely. in that armor to be able to get through. Yeah. And that's why cards like like Belittle, Minoism, this package is so important because you're, you're, you're attacking and at the same time you're finding fuel for your next, next turn. He didn't have an arsenal on the first, on the first turn, so now he's going he's gonna to probably try to find a way to... Oh, I don't, I don't think you can afford to, to put the Minoism in, in the arsenal, but maybe he has to. It's 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 a it's a situation, again, this is a, a really tough matchup for any aggression uh, aggro deck. Yeah. I mean, part of it is, yeah, you're, you're Tickling Oldham for you know a few points here or there, 
But Fi is a, a deck that really just goes through hands like crazy, just burns through that deck really fast. So it's a, it might be a, a, a situation here where Oldham eventually is going to see the Fi player run out of gas, and then you're going to start seeing, you know, you know, here or there, you might see the Winter's Whale when it makes sense, when there's an avenue to do so, to chip away maybe at some of the armor, some of the life total. But as you get to turn 7, turn 8, that's when the, tur the whole situation is going to flip. And this is a massive, massive turn of events here. Yeah, he ha in a way he has to block it unless he has uh, some way to get go again without this uh, the draconic effects, without the... the but so far, I, I don't think it's going to matter much. He's going to block with two and then come back with, uh, with the rest of his end. But as you saw, yeah, he, he couldn't use the... Like, this, this is a... You know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you yeah. don't. You can't... You either let this through and lose the Draconic ability, which... If you don't have your Draconic chain links, you're, you're nothing. Pretty so, much. Yeah. Yeah, you need, if you're Fi, you lean into the Draconic ability talent uh, very heavily. That All the attacks kind of need that element. You know, be it the Ember Blade, everything after that, it's very important. So Erase Face is one of those attacks that become very critical to block out. You might be okay letting a Choke Slam hit. You might be okay, you know, even letting a Pulverize connect at certain junctures. But cards in this deck, for instance, like Spinal Crush, is another one that demands an answer. This one, as you saw, he, he just let it go. He, he took the hit, he took the six, and he just said, okay, I'm not going to use my Amber Blade. I'm not going to use my um, my uh, Phoenix Flame. I'm just going to hit you with Go Gans, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, and again, Belittle doesn't care about Draconic. It's just a three, uh, a three Go Again that Absolutely. allows you to go ahead and just peel out one of those uh, minnowisms and in this deck I believe is it running any red minnowisms I don't think so uh, it, I'm sure it's just all blues uh, two blues yeah. sometimes they, they only uh, they only play one so there's a two in this one and only two two blues yeah yeah and in this case again that's got to go again on it. So you're making the best of a, of a bad situation here, but it's very rare that you see the Oldham player on the offensive and having, you know, having an aggro deck at a deficit like this. But uh, it is what it is. And in this case, Oldham apparently likes his hand. Might actually kind of follow I, up. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, one of the, of the ways to, to, to win is that sometimes you keep your, your whole hand I'm pretty sure he has an Oconold in his arsenal, and as you can see, he's got a Winter's Bite and the Tome of Harvest, so he can he can uh, fu double fuse it. Now, looking and that's going to be a big, big, big turning point in this game now if that happens. I'm looking at this list. Mm -hmm. You see Oldham, and you're thinking defensive stance. Really, go for the long haul. But you know what's not in here? There's no sink belows, no fate yeah. for scenes, no. S I don't think there's any staunch responses in here. Uh, there's oh, two blue two, staunch, two blues, yeah. two blues. This is this is not, uh, this is not an Oldham list that perhaps is looking to wait out an opponent. And with Prism lurking around, taking an aggressive stance might be the way that you're trying to adapt the Oldham deck yeah. to be able to deal with Prism. You can still play defensively. You still have the, the Oldham ability. You still have the shield. You still have Crown of Seeds. But this list looks to me like it's a let's play ball. I Probably I can block you out better than you can block me out. Uh, yeah, better than you can block me out. So if we're trading blows, I'm going to make my on-hits hurt more than your vanilla damage. Absolutely. As you can see, at, th at this point, he, he figures that uh, the, this lava burst is uh, really too much damage, so he decides to block, and we'll see if he has the O'Connell in the arsenal. I don't know if he kept it. I, I, I have to be honest, uh, he might have pitched it, but I'm not sure. All right, so we're just doing a little bit of... Uh yeah, defending with the Choke Slam, because if he indeed manages to attack with the, with the O'Connell, it doesn't matter. So a fused Oakenhold gets a plus two, dominate, and on hit. On hit, devastating hit effect. Oh yeah, it's not, you gotta tuck two random cards underneath your deck. Yeah. So that really just maintains tempo, buys you an extra turn to that, uh, to that degree. So there and it there is. there you go. Wowee, there it is. So that is a fused Oakenhold. We haven't seen one of these since Starvo days. 
It was insane in Star Wars, and it's still insane in all him. It's uh, one of my favorite cards, cards in the game. It's like a mini crippling crush, you know. But it's, it demands something out of your hand, but it's still, it's so cheap. It's only for three resources. It attacks for nine. It has dominate on its own. It's crazy. It's, a, it's such a great card. And look at this artwork. Amazing. And, uh, without and any there's nothing to do on well, Bob's side. Yeah, it, it, there's, there's nothing. I mean, the Phi list is running two unmovable reds. Yeah, but, but it, you got to draw them. Yeah. Only two in, in 60 cards. That's nothing. All right, so that is the first order of business here. So this Oldham came to play, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah. It's not just about the fiery draconic chain link. Sometimes you got to get frosty with it, and it looks like Oakenold is the flavor of the day, fused, and that buys uh, that buys Jonathan another turn. Yeah, it's a turn. It's a free turn. The thing is, if he uh, if he had managed to get another one, it would have been the craziest turn ever. Maybe right. with this Tome of Harvest. Let's see. So uh, Tom of Harvest asks you to, uh, to put the card from your arsenal under your deck and then you, you, uh, you draw three cards. So five card hand. Yeah, that's pretty good, isn't it? I think it's pretty good. Oh, How, about go, go. How about another How about another fused Oakenold, yeah. Roma? <laughs> That's what I was talking about. Two Oakenholds in a row. I don't think there's much he can do again unless he, unless he drew the unmov unmovable, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> this is again, you could see the player just like, uh, all right, uh, here's the bill, yeah. and you're picking up the check. I love when players do that, you know, do you put your... <laughs> <laughs> your hands on the table and you're like, well, so what now? What are you doing? Yeah, little I'm, ninja boy? I'm, <laughs> I'm a spectator. Yeah. Uh, and I like it. Leaving it to the fates right here to just roll the dice and yeah. say, that's the one you're taking away. No problem. All right. So what can you do with two cards? Because you just got smacked right back down to reality. It's and 26. Yeah. That's, that is one hell of a deficit. We don't see this very often no. of the Oldham player being in the driver's seat. But that's the way you play Oldham now. You can't, you can't afford to play like in the, the old days, like when Oldham was, uh, was a young kid and uh, <laughs> like he could defend all day Look at him. Long. That was like now, 800 he's years he's ago. He's got no time to waste. <laughs> he's, Oldham is like the Yoda of Wraith. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it is. Uh, so I got to ask you this, Roman. Do you think that if one prism rotates... Because let's be real, Prism against sta like the standard way that Oldham typically plays, you know, it's it's almost a freebie for Prism. Do you think that when Prism rotates out, Oldham might revert back to that defensive Oldham stance? Oldham and Bravo uh, might go back to this, but the the thing is, uh, the decks are too fast anyway. So you have to find some kind of disruption package and to find a way to to. Uh, Fire isn't the only wide and fast deck, so you need to find a way to. To, um, to disrupt the opponent and, and the best way to do it when you're a guardian is to attack and crush. So that's what's going to happen from now on. I think people figure that uh, the, the, best, uh, the best guardian was probably the mid-range one, at least in this meta. I don't know what's going to happen in the next one. We've seen the Emperor, we've seen uh, some new, uh, we, we can expect some new cards. The Emperor is a young hero, so he's not going to be affecting the, the CC meta game. but we don't know what's going to happen in the next set without cards. Wire cards, we'll see. I just want to make note here. Uh, so there was a block with the stalagmite, which would create a, a, def uh, a frostbite. However, in response to the block at instant speed, Phi goes ahead and retrieves the uh, Phoenix Flame before the frostbite's yes. in effect. And just keeping that card in hand so you can go ahead and tuck it away. So heads up move there by Bob. Yeah. And uh, the Phoenix. Really yeah, Frostbite still sticks around, uh, but it does bust that with the pass, and now we're just going to swing with a uh, with a Winter's Whale, but after dropping Channel Lake, Channel Lake Frigid. Frigid. That's really annoying for the five player, because uh, one Channel Lake Frigid is okay, but uh, ta taxing it uh, more with a, with a Frostbite is really going to make his turn really hard to navigate. Yeah. He has a Belittle. Uh, he probably has a mere reason to fetch, because he only uses it to, to pitch. So, um, so he might have one or two attacks, but he won't be able to go as wide as he uh, as he was before. Yeah, John. So he's, he's, yeah, he has to block it because he's getting low also. Yeah, Jonathan playing like Mariah Carey in the '90s, just hit after hit after hit. I'm telling you, it's just relentless over here, and he's just dropping the uh, y you know, all I want for Christmas is you, and the Channel Lake Frigid style. Oh, it's coming, baby. Yeah, you'll if you ever walk down a mall in October, you're gonna hear that. I promise oh, yeah. you. 
Uh, so there it Doesn't is. Doesn't it start in uh, September? Why the though? Or something? But yeah. tell me why, Roma. I don't know because p people enjoy the holidays, I guess. Roma, I'm not even. T I'm not even kidding you. Last week, I was going to. I went to the the. I went to the store to go get snacks for the plane ride over to France, and they already had Halloween stuff up. It's it's August. Yeah. This is not fair. It's non-stop holidays in the U.S., and then you. Uh, I guess people enjoy that. All right. Wait, there's an erased face on the other side. On the, the other border. side, yeah, what's yeah, going on? Nice. See? Yeah, yeah, here we are talking about Halloween Christmas. Erase, erase faces while we, yeah, we're talking <laughs> about holidays. How about we erase uh, uh, Christmas until, you know, at least <laughs> December, please. Uh, so that's uh, that's connecting through. Look at the life totals. This is actually, you know, Oldham games. You're like, the, usually the biggest worry is the clock. And in this yeah. case, that ain't the f that is not it at all. It doesn't care at all. Wow. So that's a big common and conquer. But and not only that, up, yeah. look at in the pitch zone. That's another that's another yeah. wheel of Channel Lake Frigid as well. That is a nasty card. Ch again, command and conquer. Keep in mind there are two unmovables in uh, the Phi list. Whether he's playing them or not is a different story. However, you cannot unmovable a command and conquer. Yes. And but that's coming I'd, for I'd 10. I actually don't think Channel Lake Frigid is going to stay because it g he got hit by, uh, by uh, Erez face. So there's no ice card in his, uh, in his speech. Zone. You are a brilliant man. And once again, Erez face being a very critical card. Now, that is a, that is a very heads up play right there as well. And he's keeping it on the board just to remind us here in the booth because we're, yeah. we're not as smart as these guys. <laughs> I hate to break it no, to you. It's a, it's a good way to, to help us yeah, remember that the, the effect is there. Yeah, we say it's for you, the oh, viewer. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's for lethal because he attacked for eight. And then the pummel comes to finish him off. He didn't respect the, the pummel. And you always have to respect the pummel when you're playing against a Guardian player. So there you go. Look at that. Find not respecting the Olim. How many pummels? Oh, may, only one is needed if one. you throw it at the right time, you know? One big, fat, red pummel. Winner, Jonathan Magnuson of the United States of these Americas. That was an amazing game by Jonathan. I, uh, as a Guardian player, I mean, uh, people are going to say that I play every single hero in the game, but I'm a Guardian and a, and a Bolton player, and I was really impressed by his play. Look at him, and he's yeah. just scooping up his cards, saying, yeah, cool story, Business bro. Business as, as usual, yeah. Uh, and and it, it's incredible how a hero that is so entrenched in the defensive style game, fatigue, blocking, de-reacts like crazy, ultimately just completely flips the table on you and plays one pummel! and finds it in the most critical juncture and seals the deal, Roma. But that's what's really amazing of, about this game and that's what I'm telling all my friends when I want to convince them to play it, is that there's no fixed way to play a hero. Sometimes you find a new way to play it, you find a new deck list and it changes everything about it, but it's still, it's still efficient, it can still be cool, it's, it can still be and help you win the sixth round of the Pro Tour, so it's amazing. Yeah, look at the Zalia players. They've been trying to amazing. play that hero to win for how long now and they only find different ways to lose? It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's insane. But boy, still with the Azalea hate, uh, hate, I love it. <laughs> hey, Miss Chalice is here. I actually spoke to her earlier. She's uh, in full Azalea cosplay looking awesome she uh, looks perfect in that yeah the, the, she looks she like suits it, yeah. She, yeah short hair the whole nine yards i was actually afraid that she was you know some someone <laughs> i put my uh, someone asked her to kill me and she was because <laughs> <laughs> yeah but she's azalea so she wouldn't succeed whoops <laughs> well i'm sorry azalea fans that's another miss yeah <laughs> just another arrow right over my head uh all right so there we have it six rounds are in the books here at proto lille uh, my goodness, I mean, between the drafting session, we've got three rounds of CC already in the books. The players, the big ones, are coming back up to the top. We've got a backup match for you, so do not fret. I think we're about ready to rock and roll. There is more. Let's this go. one I'm just finished too quick. I'm always ready for more. Yeah, uh, can you believe it? An old match that lets you watch the <laughs> <laughs> that lets yeah. you watch the backup match before the next round. It's amazing. Anything can happen. We're just going to take a quick break before we set up the next match, okay, so don't perfect. go too far.
We got bonus action for you from round six. Uh, this one is, you thought the Oldham versus Fi was going to be hot and heavy. How about this match? Oh, it's going to be fast. All right, so it's going to be Briar versus Fi. We're already, uh, well, uh, you didn't see anything right there. We're shuffling up this game. <laughs> uh, this one is going to be, I'm telling you, lightning quick. And it's uh, Briar being played by Peter Kremczek, uh, Krempek from Poland versus Rob Catton from the beautiful isle of Great Britain. Oh yeah, the Great Britain. It's going to be a nice match because I, um, it's, it's it was supposed to be, I, I thought it was, was going to be one of the main matches that we were going to see. Uh, maybe it's one of the matches we're going to see the most on day two. But uh, I expected way more uh, fights than, than, we, uh, than we see today. So we'll see what happens. It's uh, the kind of matchup where no one really wants to block. So you have, it's hard to navigate. Oh! So I, gotta, I, I see I see a sigil on the so maybe Bayard does want to block. Uh, oh, and this rounds on me. This list is interesting. No, I was looking at this list. There are three sigil of sufferings, which is a card that kind of like started out in Cheerios Briar yeah. way back when. Uh, but there's all kinds of great, interesting aspects on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This rounds on me. Uh, it's actually in both lists, so maybe. Maybe it's a tech card against. Uh, it, it's actually a good card uh, in a way against uh, against Fi. It it gives minus one to all his attacks. Let's everybody draw, so everybody's right. happy. So that is a ravenous rabble white border. So you get a little bit of extra clout there, saying uh, not only am I throwing four at you, I'm doing it in a funky way too. <laughs> That is a four attack again. That is a natural go again. Peel the card off the top, reveal it. Minus one attack for whatever the pitch value is, in this case red. But what's cool here is that's a Sigil of Suffering that was pitched. Another one on top. So Rob Catton has to be aware here that there's going to be a four block stuff on some of his attacks coming through. But he knows that there's only one maybe in the next uh, in the next turn. The, uh, the, the two other ones are going to be... Yeah, one is gone. Yeah. But... Uh, Hey, little uh, two and two, why not? So we're already writing down scores, so you know something's coming through. Again, I don't think there's any arcane barrier. No, there's no arcane barrier. So the, uh, actually, the, the most important card is to maxima maximize the value of the Rosetta Thorn in this game. You need to do as much damage with it as possible because you know that it's going to go through. One uh, thing I noted earlier before we went live here was that a big difference between these, they, they both want to push damage, yeah. and they both have the capability to really push the tempo. A big change here, a big difference between the two decks is, you know, Rob Catton's got the Mask of Momentum. That blocks for two, but he's going to want to hold on to it. Absolutely. Uh, you've got the Furnace. That blocks for two plus one. But let's look over at Peter. Peter's got the Crown of Providence. Sure, that blocks for two, but you can be a little bit more liberal mm -hmm. in terms of what you want to block. You've got the Grasp blocking three, Aether Iron Reef. So you've got a little bit extra leeway in terms of blocking and that capability. Yeah. And the Crown of Providence, this new card that's amazing at filtering your hand if you don't want to block or if you have bad blocks in your hand or if you have a, a card stuck in your arsenal, it's perfect to, uh, to be able to come back with a better hand. Usually but you can kind of, you know you're in a good spot when your, your opponent you know, donates their Mask of Momentum. I yeah. usually feel like that is always a good thing, but usually your opponent will not give that up. Never. Uh, until at the it's last moment, yeah, yeah. Until it's crucial, game-changing. Two go again, three chain links. There's oh, the sigil of suffering. Sigil, yeah, he knew about it, so now he knows that it's gone. True story, Canadian Nationals, I won a game in, uh, there was a, a sealed portion, and I won a game because I knew I had a sigil of suffering floating around, and I went down to one, and I, if I did not draw it, it was a risky gambit, <laughs> but I drew it, and I actually killed the dude. <laughs> With, sigil? with Sigil of That's Suffering. Nice. But yeah. I was toast. I was <laughs> absolutely toast because was, that was the last three cards I drew in my entire deck. <laughs> I went decked out and I knew it was in there somewhere. All right. Exude Confidence. Exude confidence. Is yeah. there any and more confusing text? Confi confidence too. Is there any yeah. more confusing text well, than this? I, I th yeah, maybe we, could, we should ask a judge to come explain the card exactly <laughs> to us. But yeah, as long as it's not defended by a card that uh, doesn't have, uh, that has more strength, that more power, sorry, um, uh, you can't use instants on the stack and you can't, uh, you can't defend. That, and that is... Uh, you, can use a you can't use different reactions, sorry. And that's on the entire combat chain. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, can push, uh, you can pump it as an instance. That's perfect for what he wants to do. So let's look at... Is there, now, 
the effect of this, no defense reactions, no instants. Are there any defense reactions in this file list? There are two, and uh, we haven't seen them yet, and I'm not sure he's, uh, he's running them in this, uh, in this matchup. I'm pretty sure he isn't, but uh, maybe there's a secret tech I don't know about, but he's only playing two sink belows, and uh, I would be surprised if we saw them. What I love about this matchup here is that when we did the the previous you know backup game, the previous mm -hmm. second feature table, they sped it up a little bit because we needed to catch up time. Here they're like, I don't think we need to speed anything up. We can we can crank this out in like yeah. ten or fifteen minutes. Checking the you know the discard pile over here again. We know that there was a sigil of suffering pitched early. There was one played right now, like in the previous turn. Both players are going to be trading damage, really coveting their equipment blocks for important cards. I would suspect that cards like the Flamescale Furnace will likely be paired up with a card to block out, you know, those nasty on hits mm. like Snatch. Okay, so Belittle. Belittle showing. I can't quite make out the card there, but Belittle is going to go ahead and fish out a Minnowism. Looks like Brandwood Cinderclaw, but I'm not sure. So there's the blue minnowism again. Uh, I don't think there's any red uh, no. red minnowisms in there. So nobody's playing them anymore. Yeah, it so seems like it's a it's strategy long month. past. Yeah, yeah. So this is just for fuel, right? Yeah. It's like free resources, you know. You you attack with Gogan, which is exactly what you want to do, and uh, and then you get uh, get fuel for the rest of your turn. This is a card that a lot of people were discussing was in the crosshairs for bans or restrictions. Yeah. It's been banned in some formats. It's been banned in commoner because it was too good, actually. <laughs> uh, all the commoner people are just kind of like, why? This is all we had. <laughs> I feel like generics that are too good can kind of dictate how decks are built yeah. to a degree. Uh, ultimately, though, Belittle was, you know, it got a little bit neutered in certain lesser played formats, but it, it's, it's on the radar, if you will. So that's it. He had a brand new with, with Sinirklo in hand. And I think that's an Art of War, isn't it? So um, he's, uh, he's probably keeping it for, net, for next turn? Yeah, I, I, you would have done it already, I feel. Yeah. If you don't use it on the next two attacks, what is it used for? If you don't use it, you lose it, yeah. uh, a wise man once said. And uh, So there's another three attack, no problem. Let's go grab the Phoenix Flame. Flame Call Awakening is an interesting card. Seems you like a fetch it in your so you have you actually have two cards, two Phoenix Flames in your in your graveyard at the end of the turn. So that's really interesting. Sometimes you can do tricky stuff. It's uh, really nice. All right. So with the I believe there was a uh, embodiment of Earth buffing up the defense value yeah. of those non-attack actions. So uh, is that uh, I think this Weave Earth is going to come into block three. So that's a full block. Still hasn't touched. The uh, Ember Blade. Yeah. There we go. Tasty little three, draconic style. And straight to the paper, marking that bad boy down. No problem. And, and hey. The oh, the Phoenix Flame from hand. Now that's, okay. uh, I believe that's what the because of the Shuko, that's going to come in for an additional one attack. Yeah. Oh, maybe a Lever Burst. Oh, I think there's a Lava Burst incoming. So it wasn't an Art of War, it was a Lava Burst. No, it was an Art of War, okay. So I the Aether he was, he was fetching the card, in, I mean, he was preparing to use the card, but apparently not. So it's probably the Art of War, yeah. Aether Iron Weave, gonna soak that one damage. Mm -hmm. Again, with Battle Warren, it'll stay on the board, no problem. 31 to 28, still anyone's game. Lots of runway left, but these are two heroes that really burn through the throttle to just chew up all that life in a sh in a heartbeat. All right, so that is Entwine Lightning being buffed up by Nimbleism. It did get fused the by the Lightning Surge. Yeah, seven go again is uh, with a s such uh, a small hand, that's, so that's good enough. Very good enough. And you know what he paid for that? Absolutely nothing. That is correct. Yeah. Big fat zero. What a time Ryan to be alive. doesn't want to pay for things, apparently. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Tarek Patel. Yeah, there you go. And two and two, blocking nothing. Okay. So that's a little more of what I was expecting from the game. Nobody blocking. <laughs> he, has a, 
It's actually his heart of war turn, so there's, there's no way he's blocking it. Unless you're, you're in lethal range, you're not blocking it. You have your heart of war, so you're getting ready for a crazy turn. Yeah, get ready. There's a command and conquer in oh Peter's yeah. hand. I see a snatch in there as Some well. Pyrotechnics now. This hand, this rounds on me. Here we go. Yeah, like you mentioned, kaboom. Oh. All right. So again, oh, no problem. It was just yeah, going too fast. Perfect. So this could still be art of war. Yeah, yeah. You can you can actually use it on the chain during the during the attack to make sure it hits. He's checking to make sure that this is not Art of War. All right. <laughs> so one floating again. All the clues are there for Blue. And he's just got to sniff out that possible Art of War to buff this up. But the question is, so in these cases, this is where it's good for you to know the reach of not only your hand. Can I do 20 back to him? But at the same time, if that is Art of War, what's the most he can do to me? Because if I'm at 28 and I can, if I can do 20... Yeah. It's not going to matter if he could do 28 to me. So this is why knowing your opponent's deck is so critical to not just it, it, to comparing it to your own range. And the thing is, if I can uh, on an art of water, he can definitely do more than 28. So he's going to have to block. Looks like that's kind of what he's doing here. Yeah, he's already he's getting on me and giving the grasp. Maintain the life total yeah. here. This might be a situation, perhaps he just says, all right, I'm not even going to Art of War at all. If, if we're at this juncture where you've already committed to blocking, maybe I save it for next turn when your equipment's just a little, uh, a little yeah. less potent. I think that'd be a good move now because there's still, uh, you see the embodiment of Earth, so you can, you can block pretty well this turn. Maybe wait. Oh, oh there you go. He didn't listen to you or to your advice. <laughs> yeah, but did you see him fling it across the yeah. table? Gets <laughs> he was mad about it. He didn't want to do it like that. You know? <laughs> He's like, you know what? Screw you, Flake. I'm playing it anyways. <laughs> so that's going to tickle through, I believe. S yeah, so it hits. And hits on the chain link. Again, threaten that mask of momentum. Absolutely. So keep in mind... Uh it's not just a five-card hand. He's already drawn two. Sure, he banished one, but he's threatening that mask of momentum as well. Yeah. So there's all kinds of danger here for Peter. Peter's already committed to blocking this out. Oh. I think he didn't have what he needed to go to go wide. This seems a little lackluster. Yeah. I was getting excited for this turn, but that's not what I expected to see. If you're Peter here, you got to feel like you just dodged a bullet. You know, you see this, the yeah. five-card hand. You saw the Art of War get pushed through over top of the block. And you must think his hand is pure gas. Yeah. And he just lit a match. But in this case, not not really what it is. And now he's, I think he's in a situation where he's evaluating, like, if I tank this, what can I do back to you? Yeah. Maybe he's thinking, maybe I blocked too much on the first, on the first attack. All right, as we uh, travel through the multiverse here to see other iterations, we are back in reality. That uh, six attack yeah. still staring him in the face. There you go. You yeah. I guess you block it. He used his Art of War for, for absolutely no damage, so that's um, for one damage. Yeah, that, you got to feel bad if you're, uh, if you're robbed oh here. Oh, yeah. Wasting an Art of War like that. I mean, the... The ninja clan is gonna not gonna be happy, happy about it. And and what did you what did you really accomplish here? I mean, you didn't really push through for damage. No, you and you're giving a lot of confidence in Piotr for the rest of the game. I think only two art of wars, art of war. Sorry. What's All right. The second card. Well, oh, oh, it was a snatch. Yeah. So there's no way he's leaving him with an arsenal. So yeah, he had to block it. But then he lost his equipment. Shuko gets dusted. We throw the furnace at the attack. Snatch gets kind of just stuffed. But at the juncture right here, 28 to 15 for Briar. Um, and Briar dodging a major bullet. I'm um, trying to see here the Briar player. Uh, where are we at? There we go. Have we seen a Channel Mount Heroic yet? We no, haven't uh, even seen. We, we've seen one, I think. It, uh, oh, no, maybe. No, no, no. We haven't seen any, any uh, Channel Mount Heroics. There's a Bramble Spark in hand, yeah. but honestly, the full potential of Briar has yet to be realized. Channel yeah, Mount is Heroic it, is the big deal. But he's not playing the, the Force of Nature combo, so... Oh, see, oh yeah, he is, he is. 
But we haven't seen any of the key cards together. So there's that Bramble Spark, Force of Nature, uh, Challenge Heroic, with all these cheap attacks. But that's yeah. not for today, apparently. No, but I mean... He might kill him before he assembles any kind of combo, so he that doesn't need it. That's it. And you got to think here, if you're Rob, you're not. You're absolutely expecting Force of Nature, Channel Mount yeah. Heroic. Those are cards that are going to be in the deck. And he's thinking, he's, in, he's already in the lead without finding those power plays. And Peter has to feel confident in that regard that, you know what, I can maybe take a turn off and then soak some damage yeah. to make my big plays to close out the game. And he knows that the deeper into the game, the better the chances are of him finding these big cards. Look, he's, he's thinking about about blocking. Yeah, with one of the really important cards in this deck, Swarming so Gloom Veil. So he's... His turn is not going to be that impressive in there either. Attacking with Brand. Brand 3. He had to block it because he doesn't want to risk uh, a Mask of Momentum trigger. So yeah, it makes sense, but... That's all right. And that's... Okay, one Phoenix Flame coming in. No problem. Yeah. All right, cleanup time. No problem. Pass the Zamboni. Clean up the ice. We're all good to go. And uh, yeah, we're going to drop again. Fi, no arsenal. Ravenous Rabble into Crocs of Commotion, I guess, creating a Quicken token. I don't think he was going to want to give health back, so that's probably only a Quicken. And maybe he's trying, maybe he's figuring that he hasn't seen his combo yet. He has a Bramble Spark, he can put it in the arsenal and uh, expect that uh, the next. Uh, he, we can see a Bramble Spark, so he knows he has a second one. And maybe get uh, a Chalemont Heroic a force of nature and be able to do an insane turn. T an insane turn. So coax a commotion in this case, you're like, well, do I really want to give my opponent a, a quicken token? Hell yeah, you do. All their attacks have yeah, natural go again. Ma yeah, it doesn't change anything if you give him a quicken token. You can give him an ash token. It does, <laughs> it's, it's the exact same thing. It's <laughs> equally as useless. Yeah. You can give him a seismic surge. You can give him a no, not a frostbite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in Any this case, kind of token. It, yeah, frankly, I mean, and, and coax of commotion, uh, and uh, as a card, frankly, a lot of people are on and off about it, on and off about it. It's very uh, much a meta choice because if you're coaxing, you don't want to coax against a deck that is going to benefit from yeah. it. You play it against a guardian who won't have a go again opportunity because they're attacks. Yeah. You know, that's a bad idea. Give it against Phi, who have only go again, so it's a wasted opportunity. I think that's a very clutch card to have in this matchup because it cleans up your next hand. Should your hand next hand be garbage, you know, or all attacks that don't have natural go again, that's a good way to extend it and actually find some mileage off of an otherwise punchless turn. I think it's interesting to note that it doesn't have an attack. Oh, but and he did he already cycle with crown? Yeah. Oh boy. He had to cycle because he had nothing to attack with. He has four non-attack actions, and no way really to benefit from it. So uh, I think you block it out now. I mean, you have that to. That might hi that might be one of the turning points of the game. He hasn't seen a challenge heroic. He hasn't seen force of nature, and his um, his uh, non-attack actions uh, seem to be stuck together in his deck. He maybe he didn't shuffle enough. Yeah, this is tough, and this is what a lot of people discuss when it comes to Briar. Briar's power level is nearly unmatched. It's way up there. Yeah. But you are going to take, you know, the Feast with the Famine. You're going to have those brilliant, beautiful, perfectly tuned cards, and then you're going to find this noise, this, just this, this, you know, nails on the chalkboard style of, of annoyance yeah. when you just get four non-attacks when you have you have all the momentum you got your opponent right where you want him and suddenly you got three nimbleisms and, a, and an earth lore surge and you're like what did i do to deserve this <laughs> that's one of the the issues with the deck i think is that it's really powerful but as you said it's uh, really dependent on finding the right mix of attack actions and non-attack actions you need several non-attack actions to be able to create an embodiment of lighting uh, lightning that it's going to give go again to one of your attacks. And then you also need to find enough attack actions to be able to benefit from it. So that's sometimes the deck doesn't agree with your game plan. And it's what's happening to Piotr now. And this is where the errata to Briar becomes important. Because it used to be you have all the tempo. You're attacking mm. your opponent. You're stacking those uh, embodiment of Earth. And then eventually things change. 
the tempo changes. You have a bad hand. They start attacking you back. You have no attacks to yes. clap back with. But all of those cards in your hand, all those non-attacks are blocking for four or five. So you feel great. You can survive that turn. That's no longer the case. This is the new Briar. You have to, you know, you'll have to take your licks here. But the beautiful part is against Phi, a lot of those attacks are just threes. So you can actually survive this. And yeah. Rob sees here that Peter got stuck with really with a, a handful of rags and he's going to have to, you know, he'll, he'll get another shot at it. And he, yeah, he, he actually has a chance to turn the game around. So no, let's see. Oh, he has an art of war. So maybe the second art of war will be more, more nice to him. All right, I'm calling it now. It's going to be art of war into art of war. <laughs> you think he's going to draw two? Oh, yeah. Hey, you got triple luminex ascension. You're give me a double your, art of your, war. Your, yeah, yeah, okay. It's my let's turn. Give it, let's give it to Flake, <laughs> Fidek, please. Wait a second. Is he opening with a minnowism? Yeah. Wow, opening he with the blue the, minnow. Yeah. Figures doesn't need the the resources. Hey, that's fine with me. Yeah, why not? Fizen is all blues, but we can see in Snatch that the, so it's not only all, uh, blues, but. He's, if he wants to use the Art of War, he's going to have to discard uh, either the Soul Beat Strike or the, or the Snatch. But the Soul Beat Strike gives more. Yeah, that's it. All okay. right. So he's not using the Art of War now. Three attack coming in. That's the, uh, the Ember Blade. And it okay. is searing. It's not like... You know, room temperature ember blade. Oh no, it's searing. Yeah, you can feel it when it slices your your skin. And Peter, now that commanding lead has dwindled down. The game's becoming more real yeah, to him. That's what happens against Fi. One bad turn, and then he comes at you, relentless. Yeah, and and this is the thing. It's like in a heartbeat, you can go from being on top of the world as Briar to just drawing the you know uh, enough bricks to 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 just build this wall that you need to otherwise block with, but it ain't yeah. happening. But that's what we said earlier when we saw uh, Old Dim versus Fire. You, you can't leave him a single turn to, to breathe. So this is oh, fascinating. So he's using it now. Yeah, using it for the go again. Yeah. And I actually like this because with the hand, the cards that, uh, that Peter, like he's already, Peter's already told him, yeah. I'm not blocking. And I like my hand. I'm going to take some damage here. So what Rob here is saying is, if you're not blocking, I'm going to see how deep and how greedy I can get. Maybe I get lucky off the top with yeah, this. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it's it might just be another big attack, but it might just be an arsenal card, but he's threatening a bigger picture. And I believe, is he also, he's also threatening mask of momentum on this. So this, this, this demands an answer. Is it the third? No, it needs to be a, well, there's an the attack action. It, it's well, a searing ember blade. The se well, the Searing Ember Blade was two. The Snatch is your third. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, yeah, actually, yeah. So works. this is like double so duty that's two here. Cards. We'd go again. Yeah, yeah. So he's saying, all right, we're going to go again. I'll probably have an attack, and I'll have an arsenal, or I'll just kill you. So what's the deal here? Give me cards, or we're going we're gonna to make this greasy. I, I think that's really interesting to use the, this card out of why It's usually used to, to pump the attacks, and, uh, but using it like this for go again, it's a really heads up play, and it's really interesting to see that. These players always find ways to go outside of their comfort zone and uh, their lines of play that they usually use. It's it's a different uh, different way to play the game. I've seen games where people use Art of War to to block with Arsenal too. So that's that's really interesting. Okay, so that's got a uh oh, Bramble Spark with the uh, with the go again from the um, from the create yeah the creation yeah, of the the, uh, the aura. Kaboom! That's gonna go. that he's gonna feel that one. Yeah, uh, seven attack is uh, it has to be respected, especially because once he's uh, done with this attack, he's coming in uh, uh, coming in sorry with uh, Rosetta. Hey, is and that Rosetta not Thorn? As we said earlier, he can't block any, any damage from it. I mean, uh, not the, the arcane damage. So, is that not just like the most busted weapon? It is the most busted weapon, and at some point in the near future, Briar is going to be uh, going to Living Legend to meet uh, Chain and uh, and <laughs> Starvo and probably Prism, and we're going to be rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Chain's like, all right, I'm out of here, Living Legend. They're like, are you going to bring your Rosetta Sword? Yeah. Ah, don't need it. We're good. 
I did this all with Galaxy Black way back when. No yeah. problem. In the old days. Yeah, but in the old days, Seeds of Agony were a thing. <laughs> Man, the good old days. Oh, yeah. I say as I <laughs> just dream in the nightmare that was chain after chain after chain. Well, I, I, I think what's, what would be interesting is that the next time... Uh, uh, Rune Blade goes to Living Legend, it, it goes to the Living Legend with the Rosetta, and mm -hmm. they give a new weapon to Briar. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> you know what? Change the rules. Unbound Dusk Blade, there we go. Yeah. New problem, solved. Two and two. I mean, what can he do? The problem here is that if you go down to two, if you go down to if two... You're, you're, you're sh you have to kill him on the next turn and you probably won't win one card, so you, I think you have to defend the physical damage because you're done if you don't. Oh, he's he's looking at the mask. Oh, off. but he's at... He's at four right now. He took the two arcane, but he's going to yeah, block the two physical. This is a smart play because if you go down to two without any way of blocking the arcane, Briar just needs to go non-attack, attack, Rosetta, and you're dead. But he was a, I think he was a Phoenix Flame, so he couldn't block with it. He had no choice. Was it the third Phoenix Flame? Oh, that might be true. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. So he couldn't block. So he had absolutely no choice. So no mask. And I think, yeah, the writing's on the wall, as you say, on your side of the Atlantic. <laughs> we do say that. Yeah, you do, don't you? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Oh, there it is. Five with, uh, is that? With uh, the yeah, with the one arcane. Yeah. I think that one arcane it's, is it's just fused with the uh, flexing, fusing with the channel material, you know. <laughs> just oh, over there, yes, showing it. He has two of them. Don't need it. <laughs> I love that. When you fuse or, or just like pitch the, yeah. the most powerful card you've got, because you're like, ah, whatever. <laughs> I'm Briar. We're yeah. cool. All right, blocking this one out because you absolutely have to. Any damage that goes through means Rosetta and he's is done, lethal. Actually, I think because yeah. Oh, and the two, rune chat too. And, yeah, yeah. Really good play by Piotr and really good game overall. He missed some fuel at some point. He had an off turn, but then he came back and uh, really impressive. I got to say, um, respecting Briar yeah. sounds like a, sounds like a, you know, last year kind of yeah. kind of thing to do. But the fact that uh, the game can take a, d a turn off and still win the game proves that there's a reason why these pro players went all in on Briar and 80 of them picked, uh, picked the deck. It's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, exactly. There's a reason why there's 80 Briar players in the field right now. Yeah. And uh, Peter from Poland beats Rob from Great Britain. And you're from France. I am. You're, you're really close to Britain. Mm -hmm. why, why are they Great Britain? Why aren't they pretty good Britain? Why aren't they, like, uh, adequate there's, Britain? There's a long history and rivalry be between our two countries, and I don't want to steer something tonight. <laughs> so maybe we'll wait until Sunday We're at good. the end of the stream to, yeah. yeah. I, here I am from Canada saying, just like, dance, yeah. puppets. <laughs> 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 We're not like that. All right. Well, here we are, friends. Uh, honestly, Peter versus Rob was a great game. It was amazing. Roma, uh, I think... Uh, We've got one more round of CC, but from what we've seen from these three rounds of CC, what are your impressions of who's going to take home uh, the crown in terms of heroes? Well, obviously, Boltin is going to go into top eight. Sure. And then, you know, with Triple Lumina Ascension, it's, gonna, it's, uh, <laughs> it's only a miracle if it doesn't win. No, the, with, uh, k kidding aside, I think Briar has proved that it's one of the best decks. We haven't seen a lot of uh, Viserai and... Uh, unfortunately, it couldn't show its power because it was against uh, a big high roll from the uh, from the Bolton deck. So I, I want to see more Viserai and I want to see how they fare against the Briar. But I think uh, I think a Briar is going to go all the way. If I had to to say now what my pronostic is, I'd say Briar. Briar looks like yeah. I mean just from sheer numbers and from what we've seen on stream, it definitely has the power Absolutely, level to do it. Yeah. There's some very good players that are on Briar as well. Yeah. Those two elements are going to make for a pretty easy to solve equation. But I said it before the tournament began. I have a guardian winning the tournament, and when I saw that uh, Oldham connect, yeah. I got a little bit more confident. I am still waiting to see a Bravo or cast a Bravo match. Nonetheless, Oma. 
we are just, there's still another round to go and two more days of action. It's going to be amazing. I'm so excited about tomorrow. I don't think we're casting the next game, but uh, we're going to be uh, coming in full force tomorrow with hopefully some more amazing action from all these amazing players. Absolutely, friends. So don't go too far. We got a quick break for you. Roma, Flake, we got Tannen and Craig around the corner for the final round of the CC here at the Pro Tour in Lille. I just finished my feature match and I'm uh, currently 7-1, and one, so can't complain, in a great spot. Yeah, it was a little bit of a strange game. My opponent uh, only activated his hero power, his Garvo power, uh, one time. So that kind of made the game strange, but he also had very good, very well-timed uh, like spinal crushes and channels. Like right when I wanted to have a big turn, he had that. So we kind of played a very slow start to the game with traded small amounts of damage, which is not usually how the matchup goes. Um, so that was kind of unusual, and I was just glad that the turn that I, I finally managed to set up a turn that he wasn't able to disrupt. It wasn't as good as the turn I had originally set up, but it was still enough damage to kind of force him to block and, and take over the game. But um, yeah, it was a close one, and, and not, not really like how most of the turbo matches go. They're usually really fast and very swingy. Yeah, um, I've always loved Ranger. It's been my favorite class the whole time, and when Lexi came out, I was really excited. Um, I spent most of ProQuest season though not actually playing Lexi. I play other heroes as well. I play Prism and Viscerai. I, I just didn't think that Lexi was in a good spot. But after the bans, um, I felt that maybe Lexi could deal with Starvo with no awakening and with a little bit fewer three blocks. There was more of a chance. 
And so we got to testing and um, we, we found this list that uh, we're, we're very, very happy with. It's sort of like a combination of the fuse list builds that people were running, as well as like the ice build that I took to nationals. And you kind of get a bit of the disruptive package, but also the damage ceiling of the fuse list build. Not, not exactly, but, but very close to it. So um, yeah, overall, I think I'm in, in a pretty good spot. And, the field's more or less what I predicted, except for the Kanos, and uh, you know, hopefully I can dodge them and we'll be okay. Um, yeah, I played Magic, um, and I actually learned about the game through uh, LSV's uh, videos on YouTube. Um, and yeah, I just thought the game looked really, really cool, so I decided to pick it up with a friend and fall in love right away. Um, in Magic, I was like just getting into the competitive scene. I played back in the 90s when I was young, and just, just for fun, like at home with family and friends kind of thing. Um, but I did, then I revisited around 2018, 2019 and started playing like draft in my store and had started going to GPs and trying to get a bit more competitive. But um, I guess Flesh and Blood is the first game that I've really taken like more seriously and had some major results in. This is sort of, I guess in my second big tournament, I played uh, at Canadian Nationals, which I ended up uh, coming in first place playing Lexi as well. Um, so a lot of players know me for Lexi because of that. Um, but Pro Tour is definitely at another level. I haven't been to, like, our, our Nationals event was capped at 96 players, I think it was. So this is much larger and the field is, you know, much stiffer. There's a lot of good Canadian players, but when you get international, it's always going to be a tougher scene. Uh, my initial goal was to at least day two and just try to do the best that I can. Um, I'm, I was hoping for a top 32, but right now I'm in contention for top eight, so we'll see. Hopefully I can keep uh, running hot and we can get there.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Leal Francis of the Pro Tour. I'm Tanner Grace. This is Greg Krimples, and we have one round left today, and we got a little bit of a special one for you here in the last round. We're going to play a win and in match, meaning one of these players is going to win this round and move on to day two, and the other one, well, they qualified for the calling. <laughs> Very funny. And what, what are we looking forward to seeing here? So this is a sweet one, too. I decided to uh, put a sweet matchup and something we maybe haven't seen on camera as much this, uh, today and maybe not as much this weekend. We have Isolator versus Bravo. I'm pumped for this. Yeah, I know. You were pretty excited hearing Isolator. Now, what could the people at home really look out for Isolator? Because I'm not as familiar with the, with the hero outside of Limited. Okay, so Isolander is all about slowing the, the game down to just, just this absolute crawl. Well, it kind of sets up a few critical pieces, auras in play and then it just locks the opponent out late in the game. And so the way that it does this is with uh, Insidious Chill, Amulet of Ice, lots of Frost tokens and things like that. Mm -hmm. Frost Hex being something that yep. comes into play as well. Uh, now, Bravo, does it have any play in this kind of matchup? Like, what are they looking to do to kind of break up what Icelander's doing? Honestly, if I was betting on this matchup, I'd think that the, the Icelander player would be a, a big favorite because the Bravo player can only make one attack a turn. It's just not this constant pressure that we see out of some of the aggressive decks, and you need that constant pressure in order to disrupt the Icelander player. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take a look here. Let's take a look at these lists, see if you see anything that kind of sticks out to you, maybe a little different than normal from here. I'll say it looks like we got most of the stuff in here that I normally would see in these. Yeah, the, the, the only plus side for the Bravo player is that Icelander has a lot of cards that are all about disrupting mm -hmm. little attacks. Right. You know, that Frostbite, matters a ton when you're playing against Phi. Yeah. Bravo does not care about paying one yeah, extra for its attack. Yeah, you see a ton of, like, we talk about how many blues are in Bravo to make mm -hmm. everything, so it does pay for that, and then I look over the Ice Hunter deck, and it's like, well, this deck is 90-something percent blue. Yep. But this is because of the hero's ability as well, so lots of uh, resources could be throwing back and forth. You know, like you talked about, the small attacks it usually does, but we're looking at Choke Slams, Crippling Crush. I don't think Choke Slam will be in the, might not even be in the, in the, in the deck in this matchup. We'll see if they just want enough. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's all about getting big enough attacks, so they might want all of these things. Mm -hmm. Especially if the Bravo player shows up with a lot of uh, defense reactions, mm -hmm. they do nothing in this matchup, so you don't yeah. want to be playing those. So you're trying to take out literally every single one of them, right? Because yep. I don't think there's an attack in the, a normal attack in the Icelander nope. deck. So it does look like we're going to have Christopher Ayali on Icelander here. We've got Alberto Gomez on Bravo. And like you're saying, this, I think this was going to come down to can the Bravo player present actually enough to, st to stop the Icelander from doing what they want to do? You know, from s being able to set up one of those big crazy turns of, oh, I'm going to do nothing, do nothing, here's a Frost Hex, here's another Aura or two, here's a bunch of Frost Bites. And generally, like, they can take their time, right? I've heard a lot of these decks in these matchups, they go to their second cycle pretty quickly. Oh, yeah, it's definitely a second cycle deck where you're, you're trying to set up, uh, like I said, Insidious Chill is a big one. Once you get two of those in play, maybe even three, you fuse something, your opponent has to discard basically their whole hand. <laughs> Pretty much your whole hand, yeah. And then the coast is clear to do whatever you want. Yeah, it's, uh, this is, and I gotta say this, decks getting, having to discard a card, right? Like, some decks can definitely shrug off one, right? You know, like, Phi can shrug off one, maybe some of the other aggro decks. When you take one card away from Bravo, sometimes that means that, yeah, it's gonna be harder for them to cobble together a big attack plus an arsenal or something like that as well. We'll see. There, there's a couple of things I do like out of this Bravo deck. Uh, Zealous Belting is, is one of the few cards that gives an opportunity to attack twice in a turn. Right. Uh, there are both red and blue pummel in this list. So things like this where you're, you're able to force through some damage and take away that, that important card out of the opposing hand might be the difference. Yeah, absolutely. You see a bunch of big-time attacks from as well. as see Rowls the Ancients in here. Uh, Tear Asunder is something that could maybe create enough disruption early for them yep. to get kind of on the front foot and then, you know, push the pedal from there as well. So while Icelander is favored, you know, there are some ways that Bravo can get into this match. See the players shuffling up here, ready to play this last round of really high, intense pressure, flesh and blood. One of these players will move on to tomorrow and be drafting early in the morning. The other player is going to be uh, maybe questioning their CC choice and playing the calling. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how things shook out for these they two. They could be undefeated in CC. We yeah. don't even know. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, obviously the ultimate goal is to make day two at the, at the Pro Tour here. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Like, first step, right? Make day two. Let's let's survive. Then we'll move. Like, Saturday, I like to, I like to nickname that as moving day. You know, you sit there, you want to try to get through it as hard as possible. You want to try to 3-0 your draft. 
do as well as you can in CC, and then you know make that push to top uh, top eight. And if yeah, if you, didn't make, you can't make top eight, then top 32, I think, is the next yep. big goal. Getting that, that PTI reloaded. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, we should just call it a go again. You get to go again if you're in top 32. It, it's better than a go again, yeah, right? I know, like, right? Yeah. Travel around the world with your friends playing yeah. card games. As uh, as James would have earlier played the game, see the world. Yeah. You know. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. Players are going to shuffle it up again. We're going to be starting off in just a moment. In fact, here we go. It looks like we're getting a, we're getting a start. Do you think play draw uh, matters a little bit in this matchup? Uh, in a game that's going to go real long and be real grindy, I think it's much less of a factor. See an early pummel in Alberto's Albert's hands. Yeah, and you see Alberto with all of these null rune cards. And... Honestly, I, like a lot of times, you only need one. Right. Yeah, I've I've been hearing that. It's like when should you have uh, barrier as well in this matchup? How often do you get to use it? It's it's really strange, right? And so here we see one of those insidious chills, like you were talking about. Yeah, very important card for the matchup, and to, to just have it in the opener when you wouldn't have done anything effective outside of that is great. Yeah, I think it's a great great start for Christopher Ayali here. Another thing to bring up: Icelander does start at thirty six. So a little less damage has to be dealt. Boom, hammer time. Yeah, this is the Nothos attacking for six. So we got a double block from Christopher. This is a tough one. So he plays this pummel to push some damage, which I totally get but it's not taking an extra card out of the hand, so I, I'm not sure if I like this line a whole lot. Yeah, maybe he just wants to cycle through his cards as quickly as possible. Oh, a Respite. That's a card that could actually be pretty uh, pretty impactful at some point. Sometimes. Definitely better against the other Wizards, you know, the combo versions of, like, Kano and stuff like that, but yes. it is a card that, it's, you know, it's better than a defense reaction in this matchup for sure. So we got a Wand activation here as well. And... This is just going swimmingly for Chris, right? Now now he's got an energy pot in play. He's taken very little damage so far this game. Yeah, energy pot, a calling card of most of the wizard decks that I've seen. Really, really important. And just uh, stockpiling resources to use in one turn. Generally, you see something like, you know, the t when the tunics get up to three and you have you have pots in, then they can really set up some really, really big turns here. Now we see a blue card play from Arsenal. It's a cold snap. It's going to draw a card since it was played from Arsenal and give a frostbite over to Mr. Gomez. Looks like Mr. Gomez is going to attack with an erase phase here. And this is an on-hit trigger that you're generally not going to worry about when you're Icelander because you're playing on your opponent's turn so much of the time. Yeah, it does take away the ice ability on your turn, but again... This is the, it's not your turn, it's not my turn, it's our turn. We're doing stuff during the opponent's turn, most likely. But we do see a double block here from Isolator. Just conserving a little bit of life total here. And, and he's effectively chipping away from the opponent's life total as well with his wand. Yeah, Waning Moon activation there. Looks like Albert is down to 37. Tunic I, up to three here. I call it a wand, but it's actually a staff, right? This is a two-handed staff. So I am not a D&D &D scientist or like a, a wizard character scientist. I don't know the difference between a staff and a wand. Well, a staff is well, something Well, a wand like big. the smaller one yeah, and then yeah, the staff's yeah. like so like Gandalf has a staff and like Harry Potter has a wand. Exactly. Okay, I, I get it now. Okay. Just thematically I always think of this thing sure. as a wand. Yeah. You know, it's just like bling and little snowflakes sure, come out right, of right, it right. and the yeah. opponent's like, "Ooh, I'm cold." Like, yeah. <laughs> Expelliarmus. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have an attack for 6 here from Albert uh Nothos getting pumped up. We haven't seen any really the, the big, big attacks from Albert here uh, yet this game, but here's the thing. A lot of these on hits, you know, the crush effects, aren't really going to affect the, the wizard deck too often, right? G correct. Again, uh, so much of the w what the wizard deck is trying to do is play on the opposing turn, so you're not worried about these crush effects disrupting you. It does look like... In response to this, the rest of it is going to target the Waning Moon, but now the Waning Moon is going to oh, be activated in response. Awkward. Yeah, since since the spell has been played, the ability uh, has triggered it for the, the, the check, so the, the the wand can be activated in response here. So the rest Come of it's on, not Tannin actually going to do anything. Come on, Tannin, it's a staff. Okay. Is it actually a staff? I, I, thought we, I thought we determined it was a wand. 
I'm just setting you up this I whole need, time. <laughs> look, we're not that far from England. I need someone who is like a specialist in this kind of stuff from that area to come and tell us well, I what like, Waning Moon is. Is it a staff or is it a wand? Well, it says on the card, but no one's going to help us with that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Albert opening up with a Command and Conquer here. There is a card in the arsenal, but uh, it usually doesn't stay there for long during Albert's turn. So it looks like this is going to get played. Here we go yet again. Here's another Cold Snap. Oh, that's so great. Just cycling through the deck to find the cards that you need. I love when you get to do the stuff in Constructed where you're really good at it in Limited as well. Cold Snap's one of my favorite cards in Limited to, to play out of the Ice Under deck because it draws a card, gives a Frostbite. It just gives you more options during your turn. Mm -hmm. As the Ice Under, now, hey, I can block, activate my wand. Sure. My staff, <laughs> and then leave over a blue card in my hand to Arsenal up next turn. We are going to see a block out of hand from an Ice Bolt here, so it's going to soak up a little bit of that damage, but a little bit more chipping through. And but when you see the Icelander deck taking damage like this, it means they've got one of those key pieces that they want to deploy on their own turn. Yeah. Then we see the uh, Waning Moon activation here. It's going to bring Albert down a little bit. Looks like the Ice Bolts are 33-32, so Icelander keeping up in damage here in life total. And like you said, they're just going to peck away, right? Just a little bit, just a little bit, and then you're going to get a lot of it all towards the end. And it looks like it is going to be, is that an Aether Hail? Oh, he's just going to the dome. Yeah, and so Albert's pretty incentivized to, to pay Arcane Barrier to stop this, right? And that means his turn's going to be worse. Yeah, but potentially. If he, if he was lining up a really large attack, now he's spending those cards on the opposing turn to prevent the Arcane damage. Winnie Moon only coming in for two here since it's actually... Christopher's turn. Uh, it goes in for three during your opponent's turn, so we're going to see it for three most likely almost every turn this game, but two every now and then like this turn. Oh, here's one of your, your cards you've talked about being important in this matchup. Yeah, it's, it's good for forcing some damage through. I just don't know if it's going to be doing enough. Right. So see, we get a Zealous Belting attacking for five here again. This one does have go again, but only one card left over in Albert's hand. He does have a resource floating here, so maybe an Anothos attack. Yeah, generally the second attack is with the hammer. So we talked about this a lot at one of the uh, last events that I did. If you had to pick an actor to play Bravo on screen, who would it be? Just someone bigger than life. I mean, I, the the answer I think that Flake came up with is, um, oh, I just blanked on him. Who's Superman? Okay. Henry Cavill? Henry Cavill, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think, I think he'd be perfect. Okay. You don't think like uh, a younger Arnold Schwarzenegger? Well, it's something we got to get. Uh, we made this movie now. Oh, like, okay. okay. So okay. So Netflix just optioned Flesh and Blood. Okay. okay. So we're getting a you know a Netflix show. Obviously, Bravo would be the main character because he's like he's like the main part of the one of the main parts of the story. Get out of here because Icelander just gives Bravo the business. Well, yeah. I mean, this, in this game, not in the storyline, as far as I know. What is this storyline you're coming All up right, with? Right. I'm not buying in. I need Diem Armada to back me up on this for the he would. resident. He would. Yeah. Yeah. Resident lore expert, so. I think this is one of our first activations of peak in this game as well. That's one of the nice things about this Icelander deck is you always have something that you can do with your last card. So you're either just playing it, you're burning them out, you're making them discard a card, and it taxes them from so many angles. You don't think Albert here could play Bravo? Ooh, maybe. I think he's, look at this. We even have the, like the little, the picture in picture here. Yeah. You know, I, I can't see his face for the facial hair, but if he grew his hair out a little bit or got a good wig, yeah, definitely. He needs a wig now. We got to have the long flowing locks. Yeah. I mean, come on. We, we just give him some time. Let him know yeah, he's yeah, got the yeah. role All and right. then he'll grow the you hair out. Get a year, grow it out. <laughs> <laughs> Put the scissors down. <laughs> all, right, all right, here comes another one of those auras, one of these impactful cards. And this is from the Arsenal as well, so it's going to give a Frostbite over. But I think that's a Frost Hex over to the side of Albert. Here, this is for you. You can have this. Yep. Y you can keep it. I don't want it back. Waning Moon activation for three here. And then another one from the Frostbite. Yep, Frost Hex at the end of turn is going to deal damage to, at the end of uh, the turn is going to deal damage to Albert equal to the number of Frostbites that he has here. And, and you can see, we, we've played a lot of turns here. The Icelander deck hasn't felt threatened at all. Well, speaking of threatening, this one's pretty threatening. This is a crippling crush. 
So this might spur some movement from Christopher Ioli here. This is a big attack, but I expect Chris just to put a bunch of cards in front of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're going to lose them, might as well spin them anyway. So we'll see how he wants to sequence this. Does he want to block first, or does he want to maybe, you know, make a move out of his arsenal here? Does look like it's just going to be a block. Is this a block for six? And a respite here as well. So this is going to take almost all of it down. Yeah, it's going to be a wash. He's going to take one, but gain one from right. the respite. Because the light total is lower, he's going to gain one. So it's like I technically take one, but we can just say it's it's, it's a wash. Yeah. And it's tough when, when you're the Bravo player because you want to wait in order to be able to dominate that, right? But once you draw that card, you're saying, oh, I really don't want to wait all these extra turns. I have to keep the pressure on every single turn. Speaking of putting the pressure on, here's one of those turns where the uh, the tables might be turned. This is Zell's belting here. This is an attack for five with go against. They'll let Albert attack possibly twice this turn, something that we see the other decks in this format do very easily. A little harder for Bravo to do it. Again, I, I think Chris's hand is so, so well set up to just deal with this. He's got that blue brother in arms. Yeah, card that we normally see getting in, involved in the Guardian decks, but also in this, just because it blocks so well. Oh, I, I, I love it in my draft decks when I'm oh, playing yeah. Icelander. Absolutely. Real, real inconspicuous common coming out of that set that didn't get a lot of press right away that has really shown its metal. Here we go, attack with a Nothos here as well this turn. So this is an attack for 11 it, this it's turn. It's funny because LSS knew. Yeah, of course right? they knew. Right? They made They're the so promo. Yeah. They knew. They knew what's up. We're going to have an Ice Bolt from Arsenal here. So that's going to deal some damage to Albert, but it's just as importantly going to give him a Frostbite that's also going to get him at the in a turn here as well. Ice Bolt for three, technically four. Yep, Brother in Arms is going to block here, use that last resource to pump up and soak up most of this damage. Yeah, it's just such an efficient use of, of all of the cards, right? Looks like he's going to go down 18. Absolutely. The thing with uh, Icelander I find a lot is you have to time your stuff well. Yes. You know, you need to make sure you're playing your, your blues at the right moment because the Frostbite doesn't really matter to slow Albert down. So what you want to do is you want to make sure it's one of the last things you do on his turn so it stays around and gives him that extra little damage. Absolutely. No fuses yet this game, so we haven't really seen the hex happen too much yeah i mean the the insidious chill is often the card that you're you're waiting on because it's such a good combo card you, you end up with two of them or like i said all three of them in play and then you take your opponent's whole hand speaking of taking your opponent's whole hand we got another crippling crush here let's see how christopher wants to play against this one does have a card in his arsenal <clears throat> if it's a blue then and let's be real it's all it's always going to be a blue Yes, <laughs> in the arsenal. <laughs> if, you, if you have to put something else there, it's going to really, really cramp your style. Yeah, my team dabbled with this deck, and each iteration that we worked on, we were just, like, cutting red cards and cutting <laughs> red cards. And One of the first ones we actually liked, I think it had three non-blues in it. Sure. I could see that. Depending on the matchup, obviously. You, know, you switch a little bit here or there, but... You know, it's if you have your if you have your respites main or not, depending on the matchup and things like that. But but yeah, like a lot of the reds that are in this deck are like Sink Below, Oasis Respite, and you know cards that you don't want in every matchup. Yeah, the the, the freezing point is a pretty important one for the combo. Once uh, once you're pretty well set up with what you want on the board, you cast the freezing point, you fuse it. The, you take basically their whole hand, you deal them all of this damage, and then on their turn, you play another card out of your arsenal, giving them a whole bunch of Frostbites and dealing them tons more damage. Now, there was another Frost Hex added here, so there is a Frostbite added, and I think that's a Sigil of Permafrost that's been played yep. here as well as a defense reaction with a activation of the Waning Moon as well, so lots of damage coming through to Albert. Let's see how much gets through on Christopher. I was going to say this is... I think that stops four... Yeah, it looks like Christopher's going to go down to oh. a low life total of 11. But Al Albert's going to end up taking more damage here. Yep. There's yeah. four fry spots there, and I think that's a total of eight damage. Yep.
I mean, th th this is an important turn where Albert can keep the pressure on because Christopher was not able to keep all the cards in his hand. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Oh, whoops. <laughs> whoops. Oh, uh, I have this pummel. Uh, you're you're, you're going to get it one way or the other, but um, maybe we should have showed that one first, Albert. <laughs> Look, to be honest, I've made that mistake yeah, multiple we've times. We've all been there. Yeah. Lost your dexterity roll or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I actually didn't think about it. I rolled a one, so I had to show my arsenal. Yeah, I just picked up the wrong card. Yeah. What's the opposite of a crit? <laughs> yeah. For me, it's it's when I'm shuffling before the game. And you just spray your deck on the table? No, it's usually like one or two cards yeah. that pop out. Yeah. But it's always like the most important one, right? Yeah, I've, I've been playing and I've actually just sprayed my entire deck across the table in yep. games where you don't know what your opponent's playing. And I was like, well, this is awkward. Yeah. <laughs> you know, brand new sleeves, usually like fresh out the box, you know. We'll see what line Chris takes here with this added information. Uh, it looks like he's got an Oasis Respite, so he can block for six and really bait out this Pummel, especially because he's got the Tunic. Yeah, and so this is a little unfortunate for Albert with the with the Pummel being, you know, kind of face up here. Ooh. So the Respite, not only is going to stop it all, he's going to gain a life here too. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised he didn't use the Tunic and then Arsenal the Chill here. Yeah, maybe got a little excited there. Or maybe just saving the, the Tunic plus the Pot for a really, really big yeah. turn. He's going to be working without an arsenal here for quite a while. Ooh, look at that fable. Yeah, we haven't seen many of those today. You know, look at the last of it. Like the last four we did, fables everywhere. Sure. And here we've had a lot less. Here's the third zealous belting of this game. Albert's trying to, trying to do it. He's, he's, he's given it at all his all this game. He's got, I think he's said it. I, th I thought that was a pummel. It's not. Okay. I was going to say, if he has another pummel here, this could possibly be a ton of damage. Got one resource floating, so you got to know that Lisa and Anothos is coming back behind this. Maybe even possibly one of the big attacks. And this is one of the few situations where drawing the heart of Fandel is super awkward. You know, I was going to mention that when you draw it, you're like, oh, look, it's a Fable. I'm like, that's a card that doesn't block. Yeah, all, all he wants to do is block with this thing, yeah. and he can't do it. Because he has, I believe, an Ice Eternal in his hand. With the way this game's setting up, you, you want to get that Ice Eternal into your arsenal and just lock your opponent up with a whole bunch of frostbites and then deal them all that damage with the frost hexes on the board. So it does look like it's going to be an Anothos for six behind this as well. Very, very good turn from Albert here. Especially with the, the contexture of Chris's hand. He's got a card that can't block in it. A card that is very, very high value here. No card in his arsenal. He's in between a rock and a hard place. He's between a rock and a hammer. A rock and a hammer. A zealous belting and a hammer? Well, there you go. <laughs> There's just some giant dude swinging a giant hammer at you. Look, look. we don't need to worry about this. Is, is this. is this a hammer or is this something else? You know, it's not a wand. Or anything. This is this is this is a hammer. This is a hammer. Uh, it, it's funny because it's almost like a, a carnival esque hammer. Yeah, like the the thing where you have to hit the the ball up in the air, and if you yeah. hit the, if you hit the if you could ding the thing at the top, you get a you get a prize. I yeah, could, I Bravo has no problem with that. Yeah, Bravo has no problem with that. I could never do it. But but what gets me? Got to do a few more push ups, you know. All right, looks like we got, looks like we got a big thing coming out here. We got a pot activation, a tunic activation. Oh wow. Pitching Brother of Arms as well. This is a giant Ice Eternal. So four. Yeah, he used his Storm Striders in order to Ice Eternal on the opponent's turn because he had no card in his arsenal to do that. Okay. It does look like there was a blue left over in Albert's hands. So he's going to be able to prevent a little bit of this. Yeah, well, because he fused it, it starts with the, the Insidious oh, right, Chill right. taking a card. So My apologies, I kind of forgot about the card. It's been there since turn yeah, no, one. Uh, it hasn't course. really come up, yeah. And uh, although, you know, Albert had all the pressure this turn, it, it's actually Chris that's going to be dealing a bunch of damage again. Yeah, it does look like the six is possibly going to come through, but I think this is, is this actually, this is almost enough for lethal, right? The waning oh, he, activation? He, yeah. 
This might be the game. Yeah, it's going to put Albert down to eight. He's got two Frost Hexes, and yep, wow. that's going to be the extension of the hand. What wow. a win from Christopher Ayali here. And you know what? I was actually worried for a second there. We saw the third Zell's Belting come out uh, in a turn where Christopher really, really needed to either block or win the tur that turn. And he had a hand that was going to be very difficult to block with. You know, he had a Fable, didn't yep. he? he had the car that you were talking about, Ice Eternal, that was really, really important. And he was able to find the win from that spot. So nice win for Christopher Ayala here. He's going to put him up to 4-3 and move him into that second day. Well, and, and this is what I love about Flesh and Blood is that you can be an expert with this deck, right? That's a line that would have taken me a long time to see. Yep. And he, he, he thought for a moment or two, he saw it, and then he just took the win. Yeah, I mean, if you're bringing Icelander to the Pro Tour, you probably are not going to miss these lines, yeah. hopefully. So, uh, yeah, so we see the Icelander you know, in a much closer game. Than I, than I thought it was going to be. I, I know. don't know if it was that close, though, right? right? It, like, se it seemed like it. it. It's funny because once a, a hero hits 10, 6, 4 health, it, it, it feels close. Right, yeah. But often one of the heroes is very much in control. And yeah, the they're using isn't. their life totals of resource. They're like, I'm allowing you to deal this much damage to me, you know, yeah. so I can push through. So. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the standings before we uh, move on and be done with the day. Uh, it's... I'm sorry. I apologize. We're going to have the standings up tomorrow morning for y'all when we come back. Now, it's been a long day, Craig. We've had a lot of great flesh and blood play. A lot of players taking real big steps. I love seeing all the heroes. The, oh, yeah. The, the diversity of heroes is just so entertaining to me. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, this is one of the most open, if not the most open, classic constructive format they've ever had. Definitely of my time yep. within the game. Uh, I think we saw something about, I think we saw maybe nine different heroes today, if not more. And we'll see how many of them are going to be represented still in day two but a lot of those players are gonna have to get up bright and early draft again with us yeah with us draft <laughs> again hopefully get another 3-0 on camera i don't know if we'll ever live up to that deck that we saw the first uh couple rounds today for matt rogers that might be the best draft deck i've ever seen in this format yeah an absolute heater yeah it was unbelievable but uh don't go anywhere uh, i'm sorry you can go wherever you want i apologize <laughs> we're gonna be back tomorrow with more flesh and blood